Hey there, I'm Jo and this is Looking Outside, the podcast that explores new perspectives beyond the familiar. I am a CPG innovator and with this show, I'm seeking a fresh take on business topics with some of the most influential and original thinkers. If you find yourself curiously peeking over the fence at what is happening outside your market, industry or field of knowledge, then this show will help you to explore more of that. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're looking outside meaning and specifically how our predefined definitions may not be the same as those of our consumers. For this, I'm bringing in an expert on the topic, cultural anthropologist and one of the most eloquent people that I know, no pressure, Ujwal Arkalgut. Welcome, Ujwal. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. So tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I run a research technology company called MotiveBase. We're a a six-and-a-half-year-old company. It's a company of anthropologists, and our job is to study and decode meaning. So we study millions and millions of consumer interactions, human interactions on the Internet, with the express idea of not just examining what people are talking about, but to examine the underlying context and the implicit meanings they're uh, communicating um, through the use of words and language. I told you that Ujwal was eloquent. (laughs) How eloquent was that? So it sounds like a really sophisticated um, work that you do, a sophisticated field. So how did you get get into that? Like, I'm just curious, like, did you always want to be, you know, something related to unpicking and understanding human behavior when you were growing up? Or is this something that you stumbled on? Definitely stumbled on. I guess like, uh, like most good kids or in India, as they would say, like, good boys. Uh, I was, uh, and it is a very gendered thing in India too, I I was in an engineering program and I was doing very well in it because I I really like math. But I was in it not because I was passionate about engineering, but because I just didn't know what else to do. Uh, Mm -hmm. And my grades were good, so I just ended up in engineering. And it just, I was just bored. And um, halfway through the program I met I met a guy at a bar, we were just, you know, chit-chatting, and he said he was an anthropologist, and I asked him what that was. Uh, and then he said, hey, I'm looking for an intern. He worked at a nonprofit, and so I basically started to intern with this guy and got a chance to, because uh, this nonprofit ran a free hospital in southern India, and mm-hmm. they were basically providing care for a lot of um Aboriginal tribes in India that don't access modern medicine and you know they suffer from a lot of basic ailments mm. you know I w- with him I got this chance of traveling and it's the first taste I got of this idea that there was meaning being expressed in uh, the ways people communicate in particular meaning that was implied uh, after that he handed me a couple of books on uh, philosophy and then uh, got into anthropology because of that but but yeah it was completely happy circumstance by the time I finished my engineering I knew it's one of those things that I always think back to and uh, and it's you know I don't know if if it was meant to be or uh, it was just you know pure luck but uh, nonetheless here I am that's an incredible story. It sounds like something out of a movie. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, too, because <laughs> you're the second engineer on the show, right, so, who has now gone into a slightly different field. So you're sort of moving away from how things work to why things work. Yeah. And I'm curious about what you said, you know, being a good child growing up and, you know, the, the, like the context of the surroundings that you were growing up in. How much of cultural anthropology appealed to you because you were sort of helping to understand people um, to enable them to mm-hmm. make positive changes in their lives versus was it just purely about sort of the the theory and the philosophy of understanding human humans as a species yeah i mean I, you know if, if i really had to pontificate i mean my parents are journalists and they were so passionate about it still are um, and their job was really to understand human beings uh, as journalists so i you know I, I guess i could argue that i sort of was in tune with that Part of me, uh, in a way, because I, I did, I would shatter them around. Oftentimes, we didn't have childcare. Oftentimes, I would end up in my dad's or my mom's office space and just hang around there while they worked. Uh, so I, 
think it makes a difference. To be honest, it was less about helping people. It was more about this realization that I could somehow understand people better. Mm-hmm. I think that's really what drove it for me. Uh, and then eventually that translated into now I can help other people understand people better too. And so for those who are less familiar with the concept of uh, cultural anthropology, I think we're all fairly familiar with the, the sort of the traditional um, definition of anthropology, but cultural anthropology uh, sort of took place or started to come into for its foray in the late 19th century from what I found. And so that's sort of like a slightly different feel to traditional anthropology. And then it's also a little bit different to when you unpick it and you go into archaeology or physical anthropology. So how is mm-hmm. cultural anthropology, you know, unique and distinct from those other fields? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that cultural anthropology really focuses on is understanding the why. Mm. Uh, you know, fundamentally, cultural anthropology says we want to figure out um, wh- why and, and how people assign meaning to things around them. And and I, I don't mean just phys- physical material things. Um, they could be ideas. Uh, they could be, you know, ideas and concepts or um, or obviously words that we use in language, but really it, it comes about because of this desire to understand how meaning is assigned uh, to the world around us. You know, I'll use the classic example in the United States. You go to an Ivy, uh, Ivy League school, there's meaning attached to it. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, that meaning was all about positive things. Oh, you're so smart, you know, uh, you're going to have a great, you have no, you'll have a great career, no problems getting a job, all that kind of stuff. Today, the meanings have changed around that, right? So now it, it means, oh, you come from privilege. That's the first thing now mm-hmm. that you get. Traditionally, cultural anthropologists were, the way they did their work was they would travel to distant lands and go and study other cultures. Mm. Uh, but, you know, as society progressed in the 20th century, uh, anthropologists started to realize hey, there's plenty for us to study within our culture itself because our culture is getting so uh, fragmented and, and diverse. And, and, and then, you know, the notion of subculture started to get started to develop and, and get more popularized. Uh, today, you know, obviously in the work we do, everything is a culture. There's absolutely nothing in our society uh, that does not carry meaning. Uh, and then the other part that fascinates me is that these meanings are never static. You know, we've all sort of grown up, um, you know, studying, uh, at least I guess in, in North America. For me, it was the same in India. I studied the English language. Uh, and I think it's the same in other languages too. You are told that there's fixed definitions of things, right? Because um, you 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 look up the dictionary, you understand what a word means. But the funny thing is that meaning is anything but fixed. It's constantly changing and evolving with time. The, I think it was last year when COVID cases were really out of control in India and there were mass cremations, there was this really shocking photo that, that was taken. Literally a parking lot was converted into a crematorium and people were burning bodies because mm-hmm. there was just no other way. And so this journalist tweeted and said stunning images of mass cremations and she got raked over the coals for the use of the word stunning and her response was have you looked at the dictionary? Stunning can be implied positive or implied negative meaning. But meaning is what is contextual in the modern sense. Stunning, nobody uses stunning to imply devastating things. We use stunning for stunning places to visit. That's what we're used to seeing, right? We're not used to using that in that negative context. So I use that example because that those are the things that really fascinate me is that this idea that nothing is fixed. Uh, And if nothing is fixed, then uh, I'm constantly on this race to keep in tune with culture. And that's, that's, that's exciting. 
the examples that you use there as well because I think it's so comfortable for us to think about associations or you know those uh, predictive patterns that our, our brain seeks and words you know the the positive or the negative associations of words like stunning um, but also thinking about um you know, some of the things that are sort of embedded inside of our own culture that we live in and how, you know, binary we um, we interpret things to be based on what we're, you know, familiar with. How difficult is it for people to, or actually not difficult, but how common is it that those preconceptions and those binary concepts are challenged? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think I think most of us take most things for granted um, in our culture, and I, and and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because obviously in our day to day private lives we would go mad if we were questioning the meaning of everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, just today um, I saw this article about Peloton hiring McKinsey and apparently is going to fire forty percent of its staff and all of that. And, you know, to, to our company as anthropologists, none of that is a surprise, right? Because when we study the culture that Peloton sits within, we can see that the meanings of Peloton as a brand do not jive with the meanings and the evolution of culture when it comes to body image, when it comes to the role of genders, when it comes to health and so on. So we can see that. We've been seeing that for the last year very clearly. That's the part that we try to work with our clients on is to avoid some of those traps, you know, to assume that some of the things that seem logical are in fact logical because they rarely are. Peloton is so interesting as well because, you know, they just saw obviously such huge growth during the pandemic and then such a huge fall in the recent year. Um, But it also sort of made me think when you were talking about the meaning or the rather the pre-definition of our goals and our aspirations. So as a company, what does success mean? It means year on year, ongoing growth, no stagnation, um, even when, you know, their growth in 2021 is still, you know, far beyond um, 2019. It's still not enough. Are those some of the traps that we fall into is like the meaning that we assign to things like what makes me happy, what makes me a success, um, give us these almost uh, like predictable patterns of failure? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great point because let's take Peloton as an example for a second. If we think about the meaning around, let's say, exercise or health, uh, the mistake these organizations make, and I have no relationship with Peloton, so I don't know what they did, but they assume once they have a strategy, a plan based on a set of meanings, they assume that this is going to stay static. Mm -hmm. And when they start having success, they go, good. We're, we're all set. What you cease to realize is that as meaning changes, audiences change with it. So if you, if you are, if you are uh, taking the approach of meaning, you're riding the wave. But if you don't th- take the lens of meaning, then you're basically trying to, you're stuck on an audience and you're trying to jump from one wave to the next and it doesn't work and invariably you drown. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's the problem. Um, and I know I'm simplifying, obviously it's so much more complex for organizations of the, this size, but sometimes we need to simplify to realize that uh, unless we bring a human centricity or consumer centricity into the way we work, um, it's very difficult to solve these types of problems and, and build longevity for the business. I can really relate to that because just this morning I was presenting to the business this foresight piece of work looking out to 2030. So, of course, now I'm thinking, well, there is no way that we should be making goals and and building metrics for 2030 that are based on today. And actually, most of it is based on history. Um, But that kind of fluidity and flexibility is not naturally built into businesses. In fact, we're so you know, particularly big corporations, so slow and so impatient. So um, I think it's a really, really, really important challenge to think about how culture evolves and how your company can evolve 
with it. So when we're looking at the evolution of cultures, one of the things that I think is really fascinating is, you know, thinking about where you grew up and you mentioned at the start that, you know, the culture inside of India obviously is incredibly different to the culture of Canada or mm-hmm. the US. So how how important is it for people to, to look into these things as uh, the differences between the people that were creating products and solutions and services for in different parts of the world and therefore how unique your target consumer is? Yeah, I mean, de- definitely, um, you know, each culture generally defined by geographic boundaries does make a difference on how the same ideas are interpreted. You know, we, we often see this, you take a broad trend like wellness, it has different interpretations in China than it does in North America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and understanding that interpretation and perhaps even more importantly understanding why that interpretation might exist can play a huge role in in bringing um in i think bringing us all down to the ground level to understand what is really going on Uh, and it gives us nuance to our work Um, i think it's absolutely critical and the point you're making is an important one because there has been i think it's going away now but certainly in the early stages when we launched our company a lot of um a lot of companies we spoke to would say oh no i want one global technology I don't want, because as anthropologists, our technology uh, is unique to each geography and language and uh, idiosyncrasies of each culture. I think that's going away now. I think people are realizing that that is important. You know, in in structuralism or structural anthropology and philosophy, there's a great deal of discourse on this idea that we rely too much on history to tell us about the future. And the problem with that is it only gives us narratives that have happened. It doesn't mm-hmm. open our minds to narratives that may have never happened in the past mm. uh, or even nuances of those narratives. The more context you layer on, the more nuanced the work becomes. So, and this is a huge struggle, right? And I, I empathize with this struggle. Every one of our clients has this struggle. And the reason the struggle exists is because on the back end, everything needs to be measured. We have to measure success. And the problem is ads, as a one example, are measured through this traditional lens. Ads will say, oh yeah, it was targeted to uh, millennials uh, in this income range and blah, blah, blah. And so there's a lot of restrictions here. And I think the lens of meaning is, is a way for us to break free from that, to say, Let's focus on the spaces of meaning that we we are currently in and we want to be in. And you can do that exercise both from a professional standpoint in terms of your work, whatever brands you work on or whatever, but you can also do that personally. That's also fascinating for me. And we do that um, within our company uh, as part of just how we think about our jobs and our work day to days for to drive fulfillment but i also personally do that just in my career in general as i think about where i am today and where i want to be but i think about it through the lens of meaning rather than through any other lens because with the lens of meaning i also i find keeps me open to uh, things that will not go according to plan because that's invariably also going to happen yeah, I love that. And it keeps you uh, curious, right? So you're not sort of comfortable with the the definitions that are potentially set. And um, just going back connected to that, to what you said before about history, um, I think that's really fascinating. So we know history is written by the victors. And so history is like one neat, concise, uh, collective, collectively aligned story around yeah. what's happened. Um, and obviously within that is... Um, you know, that there's a breadth, there's a diversity of experience, how different people lived through history and who the winners and the losers are and those sort of nuances that we don't talk about. And I feel like something really similar happens when we talk about the word culture. So uh, particularly at the moment with every market are wanting to tap into culture and appeal to the, to the you know, new and evolving culture of youth, etc. So how do we start to break down this big homogenous thing that we call culture into, you know, the, the diversity within Yeah, one of the exercises uh, we like to do is the exercise of opposites. So this also, I mean, I didn't create this. This this comes out of um, early structuralist philosophers and thinkers that realize that as human beings, we make sense of the world not by 
uh, looking at what something is similar to, but rather by looking at what something is dissimilar to. So, you know, I use this example of the first time we heard about an electric car, we didn't understand it by asking, what is an electric car? We understood it by saying, by asking, what is it not? I.e. it's not a car that burns fuel, has an internal combustion engine, pollutes the environment. So those were all ways in which we understood what an electric car was before we even figured out, oh, it has batteries, it has a motor and all this other stuff. And you can do that exercise in any context. Let's say you're, you know, I don't know, you're, you're working in an environment like uh, health supplements. One of the first things to, to ask is, uh, what is the opposite of health supplements? in culture today because just by doing a basic exercise of reading you'll start to realize what it is the opposite of in culture and so you might discover that and you might go oh cool so that means the world of health supplements the meaning around it is put on the opposite end of the spectrum to nature or natural so then now i need to recognize that okay so but if i'm a brand that goes to market saying, I sell natural health supplements. I'm basically going against the natural tide of how supplements are viewed in culture. How do I deal with that? So I use that example because there, that exercise of opposites is a phenomenal one. And it doesn't even matter if you know, you're hundred percent right. The point is to take your brain out of the comfort zone. One thing that I think we do that with quite a lot is words and language and obviously um, cultural anthropology has multiple branches and one of them is linguistics so you talked about this a little bit before but I'm curious what are some of those words that we're using in business or that mm -hmm. brands are using that actually is not in tune with how the average person <laughs> is using them uh, I mean, uh, there's a there's a ton of them. The most common are uh, you know industry terms, um, you know like um, you know nowadays everybody talks about self care. Everybody everybody talks about wellness. Everybody talks about um, you know plants and plant based and um, and then of course there's you know there's cultures around animal testing. There's cultures around um, you know free from every one of these things is so ubiquitous right and then in the banking industry there's words like value there's words like um, uh, security comfort support every one of those words has meanings that uh, are, are not what uh, organizations and brands think they are anymore mm. uh, you know I'll give you a great example we were um, without going into specifics, we were working with uh, a major insurance company and one of the first questions they asked us to study was the notion or the meanings around the, the word security um, and this idea of a security blanket. And the traditional definition from a finance lens is, you know, putting money away, saving it, investing it, giving yourself security should something unexpected happen in life. That's sort of the standard definition. But in the modern context, the most common meaning was actually about avoiding being influenced by the world around you, avoiding, you know, sort of being as, as the consumer calls it, sheeple. <laughs> um, so what consumers are buying is security against themselves in a way. Security against just, you know, forgetting to ask questions of themselves, uh, trying to break the mold, you know, trying to do things that maybe their parents did not do or would not do, mm -hmm. live life slightly differently. Forget about the, the the client learning something. As anthropologists, we were just blown away by mm. seeing that. That in the modern context, I want security against the world turning me into a Lego block. Uh, I think that's amazing. Uh, I, I mean, I, I could only, I used to work in advertising. This would make such an amazing campaign and a program. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's it's stuff like this that, you know, kind of raises the uh, hair on your arms and gets you excited about the work you do. But but to me, this exists everywhere and pretty much every one of these ubiquitous terms and words and ideas that that we think, uh, you know, in the medical industry, we use this a lot like and it's used in the way vaccines have been 
talked about and marketed as well through the pandemic as well, right? In terms of safety, protection, all of these words, their meanings are different. And if only, if only, you know, the CDC had understood that, if only, um, you know, health bodies across the world had understood that, we may have been in a different place in terms of vaccine adoption. It's really interesting coming into the U.S. from Australia and the ads that are on TV about if you have vaccine hesitancy, ask us, you know, ask a question. We'll talk about it. But right. in reality, it's very much frowned upon to even ask a question in relation to that. So yeah. um, I think it's 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 also just incredibly fascinating the work that you do in sort of digging, you know, deeper into the, the uncomfortable areas or those things that we take, you know, for granted. And I'm going to go back to something that you said at the very start, which was that cultural anthropology allows you to understand human beings better. Yeah. What is something that you think is under leveraged in people, not not for the you know the business side of things, but for people to better understand themselves? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Uh, you know, I was just the other day I was googling books on empathy, and then I discovered that in the last five years, every year there's like twenty major titles on empathy. <laughs> Yet we could argue that the world has become anything but empathetic. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, forget the pandemic. Look at every other issue, whether it's social issues, political issues. We are as polarized as we're ever been. And it's not just the U.S. The same thing is happening in Europe. The same thing is happening in 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 parts of Asia. So uh, look at Brazil. Uh, so to me, um, I think one of the biggest things that's under leveraged is this idea that maybe it's not possible to build empathy. And again, I'm going to get philosophical here for a second. If I have to empathize with, let's say, uh, Joe, you and I disagree on something and I have to build empathy for your position. There's no way I can experience life like the way you have experienced and are experiencing. It's just physically not possible. Mm. So therefore, a philosophy, a big branch of philosophy would say it is impossible for me to actually build empathy. But what I can build is understanding and the way I can be understanding is by under, by understanding or realizing why is it that the same idea carries a different meaning for you than it carries for me. You know, let's take a, uh, an example like marriage, right? I have friends that will never get married. They're married, they're common law relationships for 15 years with their partners, but they will never get married because to them, the word marriage and what it symbolizes carries a meaning that is different from what it carries for me and, and my wife. Um, and can I empathize with them? No, but I can understand their mm -hmm. position because I realize why that meaning is different. So, and I, to me, in, in my personal life, this is, has been very powerful, especially through the pandemic and especially through the, the political turmoil of the last few years. That's also, I think, important because we're losing a lot of that. Mm. We're losing the ability to have pluralistic dialogue, to be able to disagree without it turning into a screaming match or um, you know, without it blowing out of proportion. Um, and, and to me, that's something that's highly under leveraged because there's something, there's something incredible about th the moment when you have the realization uh, that here's why this same thing means something different to somebody else. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And it, it kind of takes me back to one of the first books I've ever read about philosophy and, and Plato and, you know, the, the idea of being punished for having your own unique set of thoughts. Right. And so um, I think what's what's really powerful about that, what you said as well, is that you're, you don't necessarily need to even, you know, truly empathize with someone but sometimes you can be just okay with the fact that you don't and that you you are different yeah. and that's also okay but just being open and curious about you know better understanding their position um important life advice thank you Joel. <laughs> <laughs> well. um so one last question for you uh and you know i feel like you've just been opening my mind to throughout this entire conversation for how i can look outside and look really differently at things but what is your go-to when you're trying to push yourself to look outside 
I'm a big philosophy nerd, so I, I go back to philosophy and I, I specifically read concepts and ideas that I don't understand or don't don't even agree with. Uh, you know, one such example is this whole, there's a whole field of philosophy that believes that we have no free will. We have absolutely no free will. Mm-hmm. Personally, I do not agree with that. <laughs> Uh, but I love reading about it because when I read, I'm, I'm I'm trying to understand why they're making the arguments that they're making. And there's something mm-hmm. incredible about that. Um, lately, I find last two or three years, that's been my go to is to is to find a way to take myself to places where I wouldn't normally go. Um, mm. and, and the same applies in other parts, you know, of my personal life as well. You know, um, uh, I'm a, I'm a terrible natural cook, but I'm I'm learning to cook. And I, I have been for three years now, and my meals are getting more and more gourmet. Uh, but I'm not natural at it. But again, it's just yet another. It's it's another way for me personally to just get to a place that's uncomfortable. I love that you read the philosophy that you don't agree with because they do form such, you know, solid arguments. It makes you question throughout the entire time that you're reading it, what your own yeah. preconceptions are. So if someone's just sort of starting out in philosophy, is there a go-to recommendation that you have on who to read? Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, the, the, the first book I always recommend to everybody, even um, it's, it's fiction, it's, I think it's called Sophie's World. Um, if I remember correctly, it was the first book I read. Uh, it's fiction. It sort of takes you through the history of philosophy. Um, it's actually a book that I uh, am planning to reread because as my my kid's uh, four, but I want to start teaching her some of the core concepts, but I think Sophie's World will help me teach her those concepts without making them complicated. The other one I really recommend is Audible, or, well, I'm not endorsing Audible for any reason, but it's just audiobooks. There are amazing lecture series on philosophy. Uh, there's one, I think it's called The Great Lecture Series by Lawrence E. Cahoon. He's a professor in philosophy, and he takes you through sort of the history of modern philosophy absolutely incredible you turn it on you go for a walk i don't know you're doing chores around the house it's incredible amazing thank you so much i'm going to drop those into the show notes um very very inspiring always to talk with you um thank you so much for for your time and sharing your experience with us and all of your amazing life tips as well (laughs) joe (laughs) thank you for having me i also really enjoyed the conversation because you took me to places that i haven't talked about i i've i've really not talked about um the the journey of uh, becoming an anthropologist or talking about some of the broader concepts, some of the philosophical concepts around some of this. So I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you for for doing that and thank you for having me on. Woodwell's provocation about asking scary questions is an important one. How do you push yourself into uncomfortable areas? And if you don't, what are you taking for granted? quick shout out to this growing and curious listening community thank you so much for your support and thank you for tuning in this is joe until next time keep looking outside